Hello, I am Minister Timothy Jones, and welcome to Fellowship in the Word. The year is 2023, and during this time and during this season, a lot of people are coming up with different resolutions, a lot of people are sending encouraging words, a lot of people are evaluating different aspects of their lives, and I want us to take the time to evaluate where we are spiritually. I want us to take this opportunity to ask ourselves, is Jesus truly our shepherd? And that's the topic I wanna discuss in this teaching. Is Jesus truly our shepherd? I wanna begin by going to Psalms 23, and I'm gonna read the whole chapter and then we're gonna talk about it, and then we're gonna revisit it in a different context. So I invite you to take this walk with me as we continue to fellowship in the word. Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Oftentimes, when this passage of scripture is presented, it's presented in the midst of exhortation. And we get excited because this chapter, although it's six verses, is filled with so many things that would encourage the believer. But I wanna challenge us to revisit Psalms 23 to look at it not from the lens of exhortation, but I'm going to look at this, break this down, align it with scripture for us to now look at this as doctrine. And there is a distinct difference between exhortation and doctrine. To exhort is defined as to strongly encourage and or urge someone to do something. So you think about uh, people having the gift of exhortation. You think about when you are praying, you may begin with a form of exhortation. You can use the word to exhort and bring that encouragement to yourself, but doctrine is teaching. Doctrine gives you the instructions on how you are to live your life according to the word of God, according to the gospel. The truth of the matter is you have people in the world who will take parts of this chapter and will talk about the Lord being their shepherd and claiming these promises without understanding that in order for the Lord to be our shepherd, that means we have to be sheep. And in order for us to be sheep with the Lord being the shepherd, we have to understand what is being said in this chapter through the lens of doctrine. I'm not saying this to say that exhortation doesn't have its place. I want us to see if we look at 1 Timothy 4.13, where Paul gives Timothy the instruction that we all should hold on to. It says, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And just to give a definition for doctrine, I stated that it's teaching, but the basic meaning of the term doctrine is teaching. Christian doctrine, accordingly, is the attempt to state in intellectually responsible terms the message of the gospel and the content of the faith it elicits. So by us going into this scripture and studying it, we will have a deeper understanding of the role we play as sheep. So therefore, when we exhort using this scripture, we understand and we're living and walking in line 
with all of those promises. I want to begin by going to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. We already reviewed verse 13, where Paul told Timothy to give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. But in verse 16, Paul emphasizes doctrine. He says, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. The exhortation is more just for you. When you understand and you begin to walk in doctrine, then it's not only your own salvation that becomes secure. You're in a position to present this with your lifestyle, to present the gospel with your fruit. So in this situation, Timothy was a young leader, so he was preaching and teaching in the church. But I don't want us to think that if we are not assigned to be a preacher or a teacher that people cannot be saved by our obedience and commitment to the doctrine. So let's go back to Psalms 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, let's go to John, John 10, verse 4. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So, in John 10, it's Jesus talking, explaining how he is the good shepherd. He's the shepherd that David is speaking of when he says in verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In order for that verse to be alive in us, we have to know the voice of God, as it says in verse 4, where he said, and he brings out his own sheep, and he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Ask yourself, do you know the voice of God? Not your conscience, not something that stimulates a, a memory or saying something positive or pulling a quote or now a lot of people will talk about the ancestors. Do you know the voice of God? To know the voice of God is to know the word of God. To know the voice of God is to have the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of you and you walking and understanding that the Holy Spirit is our God is our helper. The more we pay attention to doctrine, the more that we study and meditate on the word of God, then we begin to understand and know his voice. If you think about when you were a child, whatever your name is, my name is Timothy, it's pretty common, but I could be in the midst of other people with that same name. I could be in a crowd of other people talking, but when my mother called my name, I immediately knew that they weren't calling another Timothy. I knew because that voice was familiar to me and it let me know that it was my mother calling me. So when you hear false doctrine, when you hear people presenting their versions of the gospel. When you hear motivational speaking coming from the pulpit wrapped in a package as if it is presenting the living word of God, do you understand how to differentiate so that you know when the voice of God is calling you in the midst of all the noise, you know to turn around because my father is calling me. You know to turn around and pay attention because there is a the word of life that's being given to me so that I know what to do. So when you do that, 
and you follow, then you get to say that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The reason why you could say I shall not want is because as I am following that voice, I'm becoming more familiar with that voice, which means I'm spending more time with the shepherd and I'm growing to become even more and more content and delight in what the shepherd has for me. So therefore I can say I shall not want because everything that I need, the shepherd is giving me because I'm the main benefactor of that relationship. False doctrine will tell you to use this scripture as a way to say that whatever I want, the Lord is going to give it to me because he's my shepherd. But then that means you're ignoring the part of the scripture when it said he has his rod and his staff because the shepherd doesn't allow the sheep to just run all over the place. The shepherd is going to make sure the sheep is staying in the field that the shepherd has already prepared to know that there's no impurities in this grass right here. There's nothing here that's going to harm you. There are borders here, but these borders aren't to keep you in from confining you. These borders are to keep things out that don't need to get into your spirit or to get into your flesh. Let's continue on. Psalms 23 verses 2 and 3. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11, and I'm going to read verses 28 and 29. This is Jesus talking. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So leading you to the green pastures, leading you beside the still waters, the rest that Jesus is talking about is when we begin to learn about him. Our soul gets restored. If you think about it in the natural, part of the reason why now you hear more people telling you that getting good sleep is part of having good health because your body restores itself while it is sleeping, while it's resting. So Jesus is providing that to us for our souls in the midst of all of this chaos that's in the world, in the midst of all of the pleasantries and the well wishes that were given during the holiday season, evil did not take a day off. Evil is ever present and people are talking about, oh, things are going to get better. But I just told you, if you're hearing the voice of God, you know that things are not going to get better in the midst of the world. What can get better is our walk. What can get better is us growing in the revelation knowledge. What can get better is us fulfilling the Great Commission and through this gospel, realizing that we are called to make disciples for all and to present this gospel. What can get better is through our prayers and our believing that God is going to do what he said he's going to do, that we're going to see wayward children come back. We're going to see the lost come in. That's the part where it's going to get better. It's not going to get better from a standpoint of the economy. It's not going to get better from those factors that the world uses to judge. Just quickly, you think about it. You have votes on the Senate floor. They can't even decide who is going to be the Speaker of the House. Right now, one of the branches of our government is literally in limbo. So therefore, if you had faith in this system of making things better, you are definitely not hearing the voice of the Lord. So I'll repeat the title, Is the Lord Truly Your Shepherd? Let's go on. 1 John chapter 2, verses 12, and then I'm going to read verses 28 and 29. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Verses 28 and 29. And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, 
we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So going back to verse 3, where it says, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That his name's sake is the name of Jesus. There is no salvation outside of the name of Jesus. Now, for some of you, you may be watching this and you're a believer. And if you are following us as a ministry, you might begin to feel like, man, this is getting repeated almost as nauseam. But the reality is this. There are too many people that are talking about and claiming to have a relationship with God, but not talking about having a relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord of their lives. And Jesus made it perfectly clear when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. So it may sound repetitive, but it's repetitive for a reason because Jesus was a master teacher and one of the ways we learn is through repetition. So you will always hear because the scriptures also tell us to test the spirit to see if it's of God. So if someone is going to preach and teach and they are not directing you to Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, then what they are preaching and teaching is not the voice of God. And Therefore, that is false doctrine. That is not me giving you Minister Tim's opinion. I am giving you, thus saith the Lord, what is in Scripture. Now, if that causes animosity, if that causes, well, I don't agree, I am not ministering for you to agree. I am ministering to plant the seed that the Lord has inspired me as a minister of the gospel and for you to ask the Lord to deal with your heart. So if thorns need to be removed, let those thorns be removed. If the ground needs to be softened so that the seed can take root and fruit can come forth, that's between you and the Lord. But I am not here to entertain. I am not here to compromise. I am here, especially in the days and times that we are living in, where nothing is guaranteed. This could be the last time that I get an opportunity to bring forth a message. So why not bring forth the message and talk about the one who is the redeemer, the one who is the savior. So if you don't remember anything else, know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He rose on the third day. And if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved and then he will become your shepherd. So with that understanding of who Jesus is, understand that Jesus' love for us is immeasurable. So I want you to feel my heart because I'm doing the best that I can to be a vessel and even at my best, I can't truly begin to effectively communicate how much Jesus loves you. And he loved us when we were sinners. He went to the cross knowing that we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity, knowing that many of us have become prodigal. Many of us were once sheep and then went astray. And then he left the 99 to come for us. And even when he came and brought us back in, he didn't condemn us. He didn't judge us. He didn't ridicule us. He didn't belittle us. Think about how many times in the world when you make a mistake and people will judge you for the rest of your life by that mistake. Why not come to Jesus and let him be your Lord? Let him clean you up. Let him tell you that I love you. And when I say that, he says that I love you as you are. That is not him approving of your lifestyle. That's him saying, I love you the way that you are so that I could begin to mold you, that I can be your potter. So I'm not asking you to make your clay into a particular shape to make it easy for me because I am the I am. I said, let there be. And it was. So it doesn't matter the condition that you may be in as clay. But if you come to Jesus as your potter, he will shape 
shape you and he will design you and he will make you beautiful because he will put you back into the image of him, which was the image that we were created to be. Let me go back to Psalms 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Romans 8, verse 37, 38, and 39. Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Proverbs 3, verse 12. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. So when we talk about the rod and the staff, They comfort you, but that comfort actually comes through correction. That comfort comes through discipline. And when you see at the end of Proverbs 3.12, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. So the Lord loves us. And because he loves us, he corrects us, but he's correcting us not to bring us down. He's correcting us because he has delight in us as his child. And so therefore, we have to thank the Lord that he's taking the time to correct us. We have to give him honor and praise him because he loves us enough and believes enough in our potential, regardless of our performance, that he will correct us to keep us moving forward on his path. Let's go to Psalms 23, verse 5 and 6. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. James 4, 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Enmity means dislike, hatred, or hostility. So we talk about preparing a table for me in the presence of my enemies. If I'm a sheep and the Lord is truly my shepherd, then anyone who is an enemy of the Lord would be my enemy because I am a sheep unto the shepherd. So now why is it that the table would be prepared in the midst of the enemies? Luke 6, 35 and 36. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. So when we wrap this up and we look at verses five and six, that goodness and mercy following you, that's not for you exclusively. Based upon Luke 6, 35 and 36, especially 36, therefore be merciful. If if goodness and mercy is following me and I'm at a table in the midst of my enemies, I get to show them Christ. Because the truth is that the enemies that the Lord is preparing the table for more times than not were once my friends when I was in sin. So when you get saved, you don't automatically get removed from the environment that you were in. So therefore, your friends who were once your friends in certain actions may begin to look at you. Well, why you change? What happened? So according to this scripture, the table that's being prepared is giving me the capacity to show them love. The table that's being prepared is for me where it says my cup runneth over. What's in the cup? 
That's the goodness. That's the mercy. That's for me to be able to lend without worrying or thinking that I'm going to get it back because my friends and people around me are no longer my dependent source of what it is that I need. Because as we go back to verse one, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So I got love for you, brother. I got love for you, sister. But that doesn't compare to the Lord being my shepherd. There's nothing that you could give me that could compare to the way that the Lord takes care of me. So that's the reason why the cup is running over. And I believe that once that individual receives God, then they're no longer an enemy. And so now they're sitting at the same table and then we can go after other enemies. Because before you can become a disciple, you have to acknowledge that you're an enemy of God, which means you're acknowledging that you're a sinner. And then once you confess your sins, we then can go to the scriptures where it tells us that God is faithful, not only to forgive us, but to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In the natural, before you sit at the table, you wash your hands. So before we sit at the table that God has prepared for us in the midst of the enemies, allow him to clean us of the unrighteousness. My final scripture as I close, 2 John 1, 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. This was the reason why the Lord put it on my heart to take Psalms 23 from merely exhortation and to break it down as doctrine because of what is stated in 2 John 1 9. Notice he makes it clear in the doctrine of Christ. There is no other doctrine. Don't spend your time debating. Don't spend your time trying to connect yourself to history and all these things. Stand on the doctrine of Christ, because without that, you don't have God. And with that, you have both the Father and the Son. This is Minister Timothy Jones. Thank you for listening to Fellowship in the Word. It is our collective prayer that you will grow and that the Lord will forever be your shepherd. God bless you. We appreciate your continued support. If you would like to make a donation or pay your tithes and offering, please go to tbwc.org slash give. We have begun our Moving People in the Right Direction pledge campaign, and $12 is all it takes to help us to purchase and complete the construction of our building. Your donation can be made at tbwc.org. Join us every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. online or on Facebook. It is our pleasure to introduce our new online Christian education program the Believer's Bible Institute. Registration is now open for individuals interested in furthering their knowledge of the Word of God. Please visit bbitbwc.com for more information and to view our current course offerings. Jesus said, Come unto me. Join us for prayer every Friday at 7 p.m. You can submit a prayer request by emailing us at prayer at tbwc.org.